Hello and welcome to the Spark Accounting Solutions Show. I'm Jenny Q. I'm here with Julie Babcock Hyde. Julie is the founder and CEO of Spark Accounting Solutions. She's also a CPA, CFM, a Profit First Professional, <clears throat> QuickBooks Pro Advisor. The list goes on and on, and I'm not kidding. Hi, Julie. How are you today? Good morning. How are you? I woke up to a little bit of snow, which means the end of the year is nearing. And it means it's time to start planning for next year. So I know, I know, I know. I'm super excited about that. Even though many people are like, really already, right? But it, but it is. And how, how much benefit could a home service provider have by implementing what you're about to share? Well, a lot of people will do very, well, a lot of people don't do any plans okay. for like what they want to do next year. Right. But the people that do do plans are often not specific. They'll say, you know, I want to grow by 15% or they'll want to th do this or do that. And so what I want to talk about today is kind of the strategy we use when we're helping our clients mm -hmm. build a forecast and plan for the next year to make it something that's actionable. Like how much, you know, what do you need to spend on marketing? How many new people are you going to need? What kind of equipment are you going to need? And really think through that because anytime you can act proactively rather than reactively, you typically end up with a better outcome. And so if you've got a plan for all of these things, you're not scrambling to get financing at the last second to buy a truck. You're not hiring the first person that comes in the door because you just need a body right now. Right. Um, you've got a plan for that. And so that's what I want to walk through today. Okay, perfect. Let's do it. You have five really great tips to uh, plan for growth in 2021. So let's get started. Let's go with right with number one. Perfect. I think the great place to start for everything is looking at your revenue goals and coming up with that. You know, we want to grow 15%. We want to grow 30%. We want to grow 25%. We want to double whatever that is. Come up with that initial number. But then you've got to get into the detail about how are you actually going to get that additional revenue? Because there's many different ways you can get it. You know, number one, you could get it just from price increases. If you can do an across the board 10 to 15 percent price increase, that might cover your whole revenue growth target. And then anything you get on top of that is gravy. You may decide to offer um, bundles or upsells to your existing customer base and be focused on selling additional services to customers that already know you, you may be looking at all new customers and you have to attract new customers, which means you need even more leads. Um, you may decide that you want to, maybe you want to acquire a competitor. That's a, that's a quick way to get growth, but there's a definite strategy behind that and you have to figure out the financing and who's in alignment with you or you may even look at entering into new markets either you know maybe you go to the next town that you've never serviced before or maybe there's a complimentary service that you can start offering that is kind of a new thing that you can add so when you think about revenue growth don't just put a number to it but put a how to it. I'm going to raise prices by 5%. I'm going to get, I need 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 in you know, new clients, which equates to take the average value of an annual service contract with one of your clients, figure out how many customers that relates to. Um, I want to sell you know, fertilizer services to all my mowing clients. How much additional is that going to add? How many clients do you have to pitch it to? And what percentage do you think you're going to close? Um, but go through all of those details because having those details of how you're going to get additional revenue helps you figure out what other activities you need to take to support that and meet those goals. Yeah, that's really good. That is so in alignment with setting goals, the SMART goals, right? Starting with the end in mind. Uh, and then it, it also, the thing I really like about that is it isn't just a goal there's actionable steps inside of it yes. and then and you know you don't always have you don't always have a hundred percent control over whether you meet your goal or not but you have a hundred percent control about how many people you talk to you have a hundred percent control over how many whether you increase your prices or not 
You have 100% control about how many customers you went and talked to about adding on fertilizer services. You've got control over those actions. And so it's really important to take that, that goal that's in your head and turn it into something that you can do and check the box and say, did I do the tasks that I need to do to support the revenue growth that I'm looking for? Yes, so much. I love that. So good. All right. And that just springboard, springboards us right into number two. Right. So Julie, number two is yeah. really looking at what is your strategy for the revenue for you for that revenue growth? What do you need to do for marketing? What's your client acquisition plan? What's your acquisition plan? If you want to buy a whole new business, you need to really think through these. Now, as you look, if, if all you have to do is a pricing increase, or if that's one of the things on your list, obviously you need a communication strategy. You need to know when you're going to send it out to your client base, what it's going to say. Do you think you're going to lose a percentage of your clients because of this price increase? It's possible. Do you have people that you have a soft spot for that you're going to grandfather in? Um, you know, we've all got those clients that that we love and take care of no matter what they can pay. Um, whether that's, you know, the 80 year old grandmother down the street whose house you've been cleaning for 10 years and you don't want to you don't want to raise prices on her because you know she's on a fixed income or whether that's you know the nonprofit that you do work for that you don't want to charge extra for so price increases come up with that strategy for communication who is it going to apply to and based on previous price increases what kind of percentage decrease could you have in customer base will there be people that mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. increase prices um, I think as business owners, a lot of time we think our clients are more price sensitive than they really are. And so um, I've had people push back on doing, you know, like a $5 a month increase for their customer base. And it's just like, when I look at that, I'd be like, I know you and I would rather pay you $5 more a month or $5 more cleaning or $5 more for whatever than right. have to go look for somebody new that I don't know. I know you do a good job. So, um, so communication on the price increases. If you are going to look at that customer base that you have now and offer additional sales, you need to go through and do a strategy. Which, which additional add-on item do you want to target? Is there one or are there multiple? And then go through that customer base and figure out how you're going to approach each of those customers where you have an opportunity to bundle or upsell. Um, you may need to pick up the phone. You may need to send out postcards. You may need to send out mailers. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can communicate that and, and get a plan in place. If you're looking for brand new customers, this is where previous marketing, marketing, you know, I can't. Strategies. Campaigns. campaigns is the word I'm looking campaign. for. Good one. Yep. Marketing campaigns and the results from those really comes in handy. Because you can know if I send out, you know, if I send out a hundred mailers, I'll get two responses or I'll get five responses or I'll get 10 responses. And of those, I'm usually able to close, you know, two. And so you start getting percentages and numbers, which helps you figure out, gosh, if I need X number of new customers, I need to send out X number of mailers and have expect this many to respond and need to have, you know, people to answer the phones and then I'll close this much, which is my target revenue goal. So kind of looking at each one of those different revenue plans and making the strategy for how much, when, how do I communicate? What's my plan for marketing? What's my budget? If my budget is small, what do I have to do to be creative to make this work and really work through the whole plan? Same thing with acquisition or new, you know, if you're looking at new, new target areas, um, really, you've got to have research and make sure you know what the competition is there. Um, is there somebody that would align well with your business? Do you know somebody that's in your in your line of work that is about to retire that would probably love it if you called them and said, hey, we're looking to acquire a company. Are you interested? Mm -hmm. um, so think through each of those things. Think through the strategy. Think through... Um, Think through what you have to do to turn that revenue goal into actionable marketing and acquisition plans. 
Okay, perfect. You know, we've had conversations in the past about the cost of customer acquisition. And so when you are working with home service companies, how do you, do you sit with them to talk about that so that they know what to expect? Because a lot of small business owners think that customers will just come walking in the door without uh, investing in any acquisition, um, like marketing or, you know, any other strategies. What, what do you tell them? And, and maybe it's dependent on which field and even the company and the budget that they have. It is really dependent on what, what field they're in. And, you know, people invest in a lot of different things for advertising in this industry, whether it's, you know, whether it's advertising on things like Thumbtack, whether it's advertising on things like Home Advisor and getting listed and getting leads from there, whether it's SEO, whether it's referral campaigns to your customer, to your existing customer base, finding out if they have a friend that could use your services as well. There are a lot of different ways to do that. And it's really important this is off topic for what we're talking about today, but it's really important to really analyze um, what I'm about to say is off topic. <laughs> analyze what kind of results you're getting from these different investment strategies that you are putting in. Uh, we've seen a lot of home service businesses that pay more to get a lead off of some of the, you know, hey, I'm looking for a new deck type websites. They're paying more for leads than they're ever getting in sales out of that. And so it's just an important reminder um, to help you with, as you go forward and want to make plans and more, make more detailed plans to track where your leads are coming from, how many leads you're getting, how many you're closing, because that is all valuable data to help you come up with this plan. Absolutely. And you're like speaking my language when you say, you know, test it, get the data, make decisions based on the results versus this sounds like a good thing or someone just came to me, some marketer just came to me with this great idea to do that. Well, let's test it and let's get the results, right? Yeah, Yeah. exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, perfect, I love it. Okay, here we go into number three, start making a staffing plan. Where does, okay. this, where does this typically rank when people are making, when business owners are making uh, growth plans? A lot of people forget this piece. A lot yeah. of people forget this piece. And so one of the things we really try to look at is, okay, what, what are you going to need? If you're raising prices, are you going to need new team members just because you raise prices? No, nope. no, okay. that's not going to create additional work for you. Maybe just for communication, but, um, but other than that, you've got the same work to do as you did last year. You just are going to get more money from it. So that's, that doesn't require additional staff. Um, but if you are looking at adding new services to your existing client base, that's going to take more team members to get those things done, most likely. And so as you're looking at your staffing needs, you have to think through several things. One of the one of the metrics we often look at is revenue per you know field service employee. How much are your technicians actually on average earning per technician? And so that you can look and say, okay, it's it's a hundred thousand per technician, it's one hundred and fifty thousand per technician, it's seventy five. You can kind of look at those numbers and figure out where you're going to be for revenue and need another tech to help get that work done. Now, those are always um, those are always rough estimates, but it's a good it's a good guide so that you can see. Let's say yours is one hundred and fifty thousand is when you need to start needing a new tech is every 150,000 per tech. And so if you're at 300,000 right now, you might be able to squeeze in a few more clients, but your current techs may be pretty full already. Mm -hmm. So you've got to think creatively about staffing because you may not be able to afford a full-time person. You bring on a part-time person, you know, are, so really kind of think through how quickly can we close these sales? Are they all going to close around the same time frame? When do we need that new person? Because you don't want to burn out your existing team members either. So that's one thing to think about. The next thing to think about is once you figure out how you're going to deliver on any additional services or clients that you need to service now, next thing you need to think about is supervision. Do mm -hmm. you have the supervisors and the managers in place already to cover those 
or are you going to be adding 20 new people and you need a couple more team leads and a manager to help keep track and keep make sure everybody's headed in the right direction. So really think through not just what do we need to deliver, but what do we need to supervise? And then you can also, um, you know, just think creatively about are there any ways we can do things more efficiently so we don't have to hire quite as many people? Are we taking 52 trips between the shop and job sites because people are forgetting things? How do we rein that down? We can look at all those other things that go into how long it takes to get a job done as well to see if there's any opportunities there to maybe not need to hire new people as quickly. But it's important to have this plan. It's important to have that early indicator to say, okay, 150,000 is when I need my next one. We're at 75 right now. I expect to be at 150 in two months. It might not hurt to go ahead and post a job now. Because truthfully, like it can take time to find a good person on your team. For some of the skilled trades, it's hard. It's hard to find people. Right. Um, so you want to really think about how, how much before that need arises, do I need to post that job? When do I post it? When do I start interviewing? When do I have to have that higher buy to make sure that they're trained and ready to go so that you're not in a crisis situation when you're hiring and taking the first person that walks in the door that looks like they might be okay. Which I'm sure everyone has experienced at some point. Well, yeah. Anytime somebody's in rapid growth, it this becomes a challenge. This hiring piece becomes a challenge. Okay. And so... Mm -hmm really, you know, there's, there's, you know, hiring coaches will tell you basically, you know, always be hiring, always be on the lookout for good people, always be maintaining your connections. Um, and it's, it's good in theory, but a lot of small business owners don't really have time to do all of that. But if we can get that early warning system that says, you know what, you're about two months out, you need to, you need to post that job now. It's helpful. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah, that makes so much sense. So many things to think about. There are a lot of things to think about. <laughs> and once you figure out your people, you got to figure out the next thing on our list. All right. Let's go. What do they need for tools, equipments, and vehicles? And this is a common problem that we hear like with our client base. They maybe need a new truck, but they're not quite ready to buy it yet. Or they may have, you know, a big rush in a week and they may need to come up with creative ways to get tools, equipment. Should we rent? Should we buy? Should we lease? What do we do? You know, and so this is an important thing to look at as well. So typically, you know that when you add a body, if everybody's going out on their own, you're probably going to need to add a vehicle. However, if you've got crews that are going out, there may be some interesting ways that you can restructure your crews. Instead of having two-person crews, maybe you can do three-person crews, which will make the jobs go faster. Mm -hmm. um, and you won't need you won't need as many trucks because you've got three people per truck instead of two. Um, but you can kind of look at that and think through what can we do to restructure? How many vehicles do we actually need? If you've got you know, if you've got one person going out to the job and that's it, they're going to need a vehicle. Now, if you're at a point where you can't afford one at all, some of our clients have done mileage reimbursements for the for the team members to use their own vehicles for a short period of time until uh -huh. they can say, you know, we already went out on a stretch because we're not quite to that 150000 We're at seventy five right now, so we're going to hire this person. I don't want to buy a truck right now, too. So I'm going to pay some mileage to this person. It's not a long-term commitment. It's a, Hey, let's, let's see how this works out. And then when we're ready, we'll get that new truck. Very um, creative. I like that. It's yeah. a creative way to kind of work around things. If you're, if your employees are willing to do it. Um, but then when you finally are ready to buy, um, you've got to think about, you know, what equipment are we short? And you've also got to think about what equipment are we always renting where it might be cheaper to buy it. If you are planning, if you need a backhoe and you always rent one and you're planning on adding services that are going to require more backhoe time, 
is it going to be cheaper to, to buy one, take on the monthly payments versus pay a rental company and you'll never own it. You're always just going to be, right. you're always just going to be borrowing it. Um, so look through all of those things, figure out how many vehicles you need, figure out what tools you're providing. Do you have enough for everybody? Are you going to be short? What does that new employee kit look like? What do they, what do you need to have on hand for a new employee? And one of the things that we do, like in my own business, when I hire a new employee, I have a list of equipment that we get for them, a list of software that we need to buy. I have a list of standard office supplies that we need to make sure is provided to them. You should be doing the same thing for your service techs, for your supervisors, for your managers. Know what those purchases are. Have that list. It may change over time, but having that base list and knowing about what it, it costs is really helpful as you're doing this planning. Again, collecting data. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But go through and figure out right. how you're going to, what, what do you need to complete the jobs to get the revenue that we came up with at the very beginning of this whole yeah. process? Very good. Very good. Well, and that's really kind of, you've already touched on it a little bit, but let's talk a little bit more uh, on number five, new or used lease or buy. Okay. These are questions we get all the time. And it's important to take not only the cost into account, but also take the tax benefits of each of these different items into account. And I can't give you tax advice for your business because I don't know your situation. But for when you're looking at new versus used, there's different depreciation rules for new versus used property. There's bonus depreciation that's generally only available to new equipment. There's um, section 179 depreciation that's an accelerated depreciation. Both of those just mean you get to expense more when you buy it than, than later on. Um, section 179 is available for new or used. But there can also be rules around how much you can take advantage of those. Um, some of our, you know, some of our Home service businesses aren't driving big trucks around or big vans around that don't have depreciation limits. Some of them are driving little cars that you would be surprised what the IRS considers a luxury auto. So you want to make sure you really understand as you're thinking through new or used and you know what, what you're going to buy, what is going to bring you the tax benefits that you want and what is going to fit in with your existing fleet um if you've got a if you've got a if you've got a theme going on you want to make sure that you keep that theme going on so really think through that newer use talk to your tax professional as you're thinking through that now with the lease or buy decision this is this is a conversation we have as well when you're thinking through this there's a lot of factors that go into play um, number one, how long do you use these vehicles for? Most home service businesses I know take their vehicles and drive them into the ground. They keep the maintenance up on them, but they keep using them because once they've got that, they usually wrap it. Mm -hmm. um, they usually do all these things. And to get a new one, you add all those costs in. So um, generally speaking, but not always, Driving a vehicle into the ground will often push you closer to the buy side of things. Um, switching cars every couple years will push you more towards the lease side of things. But it's important to look at that. How long are you going to use it? What are the terms of the loan versus the terms of the lease? And what are the tax benefits of the purchase versus the tax benefits of leasing? And you really need to go through all of those calculations. We're going to share in the links um, afterwards. I'll come back in and share just a couple online calculators. Oh, thank goodness. I, I literally was about to ask you, is there any way that we could do this, right? Just yeah. on our own and kind of make a good assessment. Yeah. There are some online calculators that kind of look at that. A lot of them are geared more towards like you and I buying our personal autos, not necessarily towards business vehicles. There's one link that I'm going to do that is geared more towards business vehicles. But I wanna make the caveat on any of these, 
these are not a substitute necessarily for professional advice That's because fair. we don't know how up to date these calculators are. We don't know if they're programmed correctly. And so use them at your own risk. If you, if it's a really big, important decision, always talk to your financial advisor, talk to your tax professional, talk to your accountant, figure out what the best move is for you. If it's going to be make or break. Um, if you're, you know, a lot of these don't have like lifelong impact on your income, right? but they might have a significant impact this year that you would want to know one way or the other, which direction to go. Okay. Those are five great tips for growth. How useful would it be for the end of this year for a business owner to read the profit first core chapters? You know what, as you're building that plan, we like to go through and calculate what our allocation percentages are. Our, is our OPEX in line with what it should be? Is our owner's pay in line with what it should be? And so using that framework that you're getting those five core chapters and applying it to your budget would be very helpful to see right, like, where you've been and how you can improve. Well, then we're going to give people the fir the five core chapters for free. Awesome. With awesome. the link right there at the bottom of your screen. It's also in the comments. So, yeah, uh, I think, you know, 2021 could be a banner year with the, with laying this this foundation and this ground doing this groundwork. Exactly. You know, 2020 for a lot of our home service providers actually ended up being a OK year. Awesome. Some of them have record years, but having this plan in place at being able to act proactively instead of reactively really gives you a lot of power and helps you sleep better as a business owner. And that's, that's what planning can do for you. Awesome. Such great information as always, Julie, if people want to get in contact with you, what is the best way? Feel free to hit the contact us button on our Facebook page and we will um, we will get back with you. Excellent. Awesome. Very good. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. Happy Thanksgiving and we'll see you next month.